Howdy, welcome to episode six of Heat and Low, where today we are talking about our Golden Knights trying to close out the Canucks, our Aces failing to travel past the Mercury, Las Vegas Raiders making some huge roster cuts just in time for the upcoming NFL season, and our UNLV football team rallying together for the return of live sports. So I don't even have to say anything. Let's just go ahead and play the intro. So our Golden Knights couldn't get the job done on Tuesday after going up 3-1. The Canucks responded. We knew they were going to with a 2-1 victory. And now it goes to an all-important game number six for our Golden Knights to try and do it again. This was the first time that Jacob Markstrom, the goalie for the Canucks, didn't play this whole postseason, and I think it was smart. Um, he's he's had a tremendous run, but I think, you know, to, to give him some rest, that was important, and Thatcher Demko, his backup, did just that. Had 42 saves. The Golden Knights outshot the Canucks 43-17, to but still, Demko stopped a lot of the shots, only let one goal in, so he did a fabulous job for them, and I think they're going to get Markstrom back on the ice for Game 6, and we'll see what happens. In terms of our Golden Knights, Robin Leonard is now 2-2 two and two in this series. Both of the wins have been shutouts, while in the losses, he's given up 7 goals, so obviously he really plays better when, when he can kind of minimize the the attacks, which makes sense as a goalie. Marc-Andre Fleury has played in one game. He played in game four where the Golden Knights were up 2-1. They, then they trailed 3-2 into the third, and they scored three goals within three and a half minutes. Just insane. And so he played a great game. He stays undefeated in the postseason for our Golden Knights. It's interesting what's going to happen in game six. Do they go back to Fleury? Who, oh, again, is pretty fresh. Leonard has played most of the games in the postseason, so do you kind of give Flurry another chance? I don't know if Pete DeVore is going to do that. He's probably going to stick with Leonard. They they've kind of have shown, hey, Leonard is our guy, and unless he's struggling mightily, then we're going to throw Flurry in. And so I don't think you'll see Flurry in, unless case if Game Six is horrendous for Leonard, then for Game Seven. Everything on the line, they might throw in Flurry. I'd like to see him in in Game Six. Just give him another shot. He's a fantastic goalie. I get he's older. The same thing that the Canucks did with Markstrom. Give Leonard some rest. Give Flurry a couple games. I mean, he he is capable. The fact that before he had PK Saban or Saban as his backup, Flurry was taking most of the reps. Wasn't getting a lot of rest. Now you have a guy like Leonard who's taking the forefront. Let Flurry come in with his experience and hopefully, you know, see see what he can do. And if he struggles, then you go back to Leonard. But we'll see. We'll see what Pete DeBoer does. Now, the Golden Knights have come out and said, hey, if we get an increase of traffic around the net, I think or they think that that will help them win. They think they failed to do that in Game 5. If they capitalize in Game 6, they believe that will that'll lead to a win. I know they're having flashbacks of last year. They were up 3-1 against our rivals, the San Jose Sharks. And then the Sharks won three in a row, came back to win the series in 7. Including in Game 7, there was a crazy call. I think it was on Thomas Nosak. And... He went to the penalty, uh, penalty box. I've never seen this. Usually power plays are two minutes. It was a five-minute power play. The Sharks, I think, scored four goals within that, took the lead, took the momentum, and took the series. So I know the Golden Knights are kind of maybe thinking about that and like, hey, let's try take it one game at a time. I believe in them. There's been a lot of change, though. We have new players, including Zach Whitecloud, Alex Martinez, and, of course, Robin Leonard. So I think overall what I've been seeing from the Golden Knights, they have been getting a lot of help. There's been a lot of great strategic play with with Mark Stone, Max Max Pacioretty, Alex Tuck, Riley Smith has had a heck of a postseason. So 
I do think they're fine. Again, we'll see what Pete DeBoer decides to do. Um, because by the time you hear this game six will have already happened. So we'll see. Does he stick with Leonard? Does he go with Flurry? For me, I think he should go for go with Flurry. I think, yes, if the Golden Knights, that's when they play better. If there's more traffic around the net, they can usually capitalize on like rebounded shots and that'll help them. So we'll see again what happens. Um, game six is tonight, again, for you. It'll have already happened Thursday. If it if the Golden Knights win, then they'll await the winner of the Colorado Avalanche and Dallas Stars, which that has turned into a great series. Same thing. Dallas was up 3-1. Avalanche have won two straight. Now that's going to Game 7. If the Golden Knights fail to close out the Canucks, then Game 7 will be a back-to-back on Friday. I do think you're going to see Flurry. If that happens, if Leonard plays tonight and the Golden Knights lose, I think you'll see Flurry on Friday. If they play Flurry tonight and the Golden Knights lose, I think you see Leonard. So I think either way, if it goes to a game seven, you're going to see Flurry. So we'll see what happens. Hopefully they can close it out. I, I, I'm, I'm really hoping they're very talented. I do think they can go all, all the way. They just have to do the necessary factors. So Golden Knights just practice what you preach get the traffic increased around the net give some give some reps to flurry I'm, I'm telling you just give him some time give Leonard hey you deserve some time off if we go to game seven if flurry is struggling mightily we we, we will put you back you're our guy I you know whatever but I do think let's not just shut out flurry so that's what I think anyway Go Knights go! Hopefully it just finishes in Game 6. Moving on to our Las Vegas Aces. They obviously are having a tremendous season, but they have failed to beat the Chicago Sky this year and also the Phoenix Mercury. Now this time, it was Deanna Tarasi, a veteran in the game, going to be a Hall of Famer. She dropped 32 points. Now the surprising thing is it's not her going off but the fact that the aces fully loaded lost to a short-handed mercury team a team that didn't have bria hartley or Brittany griner two of their better players obviously tarasi being the main star but it was just a struggle the aces struggle from the three-point line being outshot 42 to 9 from three so the mercury were on they were on it it was a good balance scoring from the Aces. I mean, Jackie Young led the way with 20 points. Derrick Hamby had 18 points, 13 rebounds. Asia Wilson, 17 points, 10 rebounds. And Kayla McBride had 14 points. So when you look at that, you're like, okay, they had great diverse scoring all across the board. What happened? Well, again, the three-point barrage from Phoenix just happened and Deanna Taurasi just had her way and so I think the aces in their losses have some things to look at um again I think when 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 maybe they're I think they try and get into this three-point competition I think you saw that with the sky and I think you saw it again with the mercury they kind of stray away from their game their game is playing through their bigs playing through Asia Wilson and so when they try to get away from that and rely maybe on like a Kayla McBride to, hey, go off, that's not their MO. And so they just need to stick to what they're doing. They only lost by seven points, but I just think, again, Aces basketball re- revolves around Asia Wilson. Aces Asia. It, it totally makes sense. So I think they just need to get back to that. They have six games remaining they are now 12 and 5 and so during these six games they play two of the top teams they play the LA Sparks who now have the second best record the Aces have fallen into third so that game will be uh, their second to last game and then their final game will be the makeup game against the Seattle Storm that they were supposed to play, but then the league was put on pause because of, obviously, the travesty of Jacob Blake. 
So that will be their final game. So they have two big matchups coming up. Now, they already clinched the playoff berth. That's a given. But again, the thing to remember is they need one of the top two seeds to be able to clinch a double bye straight into the WA semifinals. If they don't do it, I mean, yeah, in hindsight, is it that big of a deal? No. They're very talented, and they can go very far without having that. But think about it. If you already have that advantage, that puts you way ahead of everybody else, gets you some extended rest. And so I think that's very beneficial. So those, so hopefully they can get back onto this winning streak. Again, six games left, and two of the best teams, or the two best teams in the league, they have them scheduled for the last two games. Only fitting, right? So for our Aces, I just think you need to, you need to get back to your game. Go through Asia Wilson. I think you've seen that in their losses, both to the Mercury and the Sky. They, they try and rely on someone else, get out of their element, and they just need to remember, no, do what got you here. Don't start doing things because, you know, an, another, don't, don't accommodate um, or don't, don't tailor your game to the opponent. Play your game. They're going to play their game. You play your game. And I'm not, I'm not saying that's always going to result in a win, but you're going to be much better off. So hopefully they can get back to playing Aces basketball. Again, Aces Asia. It makes sense. Go through her. Billy Lambert, please drill it in their heads. Hey, I'm not, I'm not saying that other, other, other players can't go off and have, the, have their night. I'm not saying that. But do what get but do what got you here. Do what got you here. Lady Aces, keep on going. You're having a tremendous season, and I can't wait to see you in the playoffs. So it's crazy to think we're already in September, which means football season is right around the corner, and all these teams are making roster cuts, including our Las Vegas Raiders. They are down to 74 players. They have to get it down to a 53-man roster by September 5th. So obviously. They only have a day, a day to, to do that. Um, and by the time you hear this, again, there'll, there'll be more moves made. But they have placed Tyrell Williams on injured reserve. He is a wide receiver, suffered a torn labrum, and was reported to ha- try to play through that injury. Now it's been confirmed that he's going to have season-ending surgery, which I always hate to hear just because it, I get it, it's part of the game, but but it, it, it sucks. Before you even get to step on the field, it's like, no, you're gonna have to wait until next year. Football already doesn't have a long shelf life in terms of career. You look at sports like basketball, baseball, the players are able to play longer just because it's not as physical. Football is, is not the same, so losing a year is like, losing five years in the NBA or, or something like that. It's, it's equivalent. So I always hate to hear that, but that's official. Now, the uh, Raiders have also released these players, defensive end Sharif Finch, outside linebacker Jordan Roos, and Jordan Devi. Uh, cornerback Nick Nelson, who failed his physical, I mean, shame on you. Like, if, if, if that's why you got released, come on. You, you should know... At this point, if you're trying to make the team, you, you gotta you gotta stay away from from the enhancements and the drugs. Like you just, I never understand that. But but that's that, that's me. They also released running back Rod Smith and cornerback Prince Akamara. I can never say his name right. He was released on Monday, but that was only to make room for the incoming linebacker Raquan McMillan who the team received in a trade from the Miami Dolphins. So that will be a big addition. Again, the Raiders have made big additions this offseason. They got Corey Littleton from the Rams. Obviously, they got Henry Ruggs in the draft. Wide receiver Nelson Aguilar came from the Eagles. Jason Witten came as a veteran tight end from the Cowboys. Um, I mean, they... Are, are primed, I feel, 
to finish behind the Chiefs. I still think the Chiefs, with now their core group, are still a better team. We're going to have to see how the Raiders come together. But there's no reason why the Raiders should not finish second. To me, they're better with the Chargers. Phillip Rivers is gone, even though I feel like he was on his down year. They brought in Justin Herbert, which I think he will shine. I just don't know if that's going to be this year. And then you have the Broncos, who are kind of just dead in the water at, at, at this moment. So to me, there's no reason why the Raiders should not finish at least second in the AFC West. But we will have to see what happens. Again, a lot of it requires Derek Carr's play. How is he going to play? He's going to be the main catalyst for how far this team goes. However far Derek Carr goes, that's how far the Raiders are going to go playing in Allegiant Stadium, moving to Las Vegas. There's been a lot of changes, and I can't wait uh, to see how they are. I can't wait to get into that stadium whenever that happens um, because who knows if it's going to be 2021, but whenever that is, I can't wait to kind of be in there and experience that. But the Raiders, I'm expe- I'm expecting some, some pretty – I have some pretty mild expectations. Again, at least second – in the AFC West, and I don't think that's asking a lot. I'm not asking you to beat the Chiefs because I I don't know if you're that talented yet, but definitely when it comes to your own division, you should finish second. That's just my opinion. We'll see how Derek Carr plays. We'll see how John Gruden gets these guys together and ready for the 2020 season because it seems like it's going to happen. We haven't heard anything official whether they're going to – we haven't heard like they're they're going to follow baseball and play in their own region. It just seems like it's going to be a regular season. Some stadiums are adding fans. Others aren't. It should be interesting either way. But <sighs> Raiders, I got your gear on. So it, it, it's, it's time to Raider up. So I thought this was a pretty awesome story to end on. Our UNLV football team will not be playing this fall. Have decided to postpone it to spring depending what happens hopefully we'll have a season then but Marcus Arroyo the new head coach that transferred from the University of Oregon he was the offensive coordinator there with Justin Herbert so there's there's a little link there he he decided to join the football team they gathered at the Thomas and Mac to sell the support the we make events red alert restart kind of celebrating the return of live sports with like the upcoming football season. Obviously, you know, some of these college teams and conferences will be having the season, the SEC, the ACC. I don't agree with it. I've already spoke about my thoughts before, but yeah. So I I thought this was really cool um, and kind of shows their their togetherness. And I really like Marcus Arroyo. It reminds me of when TJ Otzenberger got here for the basketball team. I just thought he was very involved with the team. He really, I feel, showed like, I want to turn this program around. And I feel like Marcus Arroyo doing this with the UNLV football team is kind of showing, hey, yeah, we're here for the long run. I support my team. And he's making it known. He's going out doing these team activities and supporting like, hey, we're not having a season this fall, but when we do have a season, like, we'll be ready. And I think it just shows the, again, the camaraderie that this team has under him. He's already, in my opinion, making a change. And so I commend him for that. Um, now, they do have a Rebel Athletic Fund. If, if you want to donate in order to help out during uh, these unprecedented times, you can follow them on social media at UNLVRAF for the Rebel Athletic Fund. Um, so if you want to donate, again, follow them on social media at UNLVRAF. But I thought it was just a really cool story. To end on, it's showing me his commitment. And I do think UNLV is going to be much better going forward. Um, I'm not saying they're going to have a turnaround in 
in, in the next season. It usually takes a little bit, but I do think having a prominent guy from Oregon come here, I think it's going to attract a lot of, of players here, and depending how the program does do, it should be very interesting. So props to you, Coach Arroyo, and our UNLV Rebels. That does it for this week of Heat and Low. Thank you for joining me. I know we covered a lot, but I think it was important, and I hope, as always, you enjoyed. And I will see you again next week. Please take care. Have a fantastic Labor Day weekend. Uh, sit back, barbecue, swim. If you have a pool, I'm jealous. Uh, but just take care of yourselves, and I will talk to you again next week.